couple of weeks ago, Saturday, I decided to stay home from work. I was kind of feeling under the weather. And the night before, I just received some really horrible news. And I just, I, I didn't want to go to work. So sometime in the afternoon, the phone rang. And I saw the idea. I didn't recognize the name, the phone number, even the area code. Let the machine get it. No message. A minute later, the phone rang again. Same name, same number. And something told me to pick up the phone. And the caller said, I'm looking for either Donna or Tony from Story Swan. And I said, well, this is, this is Donna. I'm a friend of Steve Robinson's. Mm -hmm. And I was first off very touched that, uh, the first thing I said was, we are very much aware and we're devastated. I mean, that was, that, that was the word I had. He wanted to make sure that first of all, we knew, which I was very grateful for. And secondly, he wanted to see if the salon would be doing anything. He told me he commuted between uh, the East and the West Coast. And if we were doing something, he was in town, he'd like to attend. And we spoke a little bit more about Steve. Honestly, when I had found out the night before, I had no words. I, I did not even talk to Tony that night because I couldn't. But this was the first time that I was able to talk a little bit about Steve and he told me about their friendship and I think, no, he told me that this was the first time he was also able to talk to someone who knew Steve. So a few days later we had um, gotten a date, uh, the 12th, uh, a week from this Friday, and I let, let him know when it was and he told me that he would not be in town, but he would be in town the week before. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring up a friend of Steve Robinson's and a friend of Story Salons. Please welcome home Ted Seifman. Thank you. Just using this so my hands don't shake with the paper. <laughs> That's my buddy, oh, right here, Steve, and that's the shirt he gave me last, last month, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go two minutes over, I've edited everything I could. Um, I'm here to say a couple of things about my buddy Stevie. Um, we're going to start at the beginning. I love casinos. I love the energy, the excitement, and the fact that you can forget all your woes of the world and immerse yourself into another place, hopefully a profitable one, but at least an escape. So I'm giving up Las Vegas because it's just too many people with attitudes and too many children hanging around. So if I wanted to go to Disneyland, I, you know, I'd go to Anaheim, but I found Laughlin. Uh, a friend of a friend told me it might be what I was searching for, and it really was. Uh, the Riverside Casino, not a kid in sight, not a diamond-clad housewife of Beverly Hills, no friends to visit that would interrupt me going to bed early or staying up late or anything like that. This was, of course, until I met this truly crazy, insane person. I had been going to the Riverside pretty regularly for about two or three years when one night I sat down at an empty blackjack table. After some time, a rather loud couple sat down who seemed to think they were the world's experts on the game and obviously not only knew blackjack, but most certainly knew black label. <clears throat> um, their vibe spread in the casino, and before long, all seats were filled with the same sort of folk. Uh, it didn't seem that there were any other empty seats, so I decided to stay a wee bit longer at that table. Thank God I decided to stay. Um, here came a new dealer. A rather pleasant looking chap, uh, nothing much to say, at least at the beginning. After dealing several minutes, the vocal levels, alcohol consumption were escalating and it seemed to have an interesting reaction on this guy, Steve. Mm -hmm. He asked the man in seat five, which was to his right, I was in number one to his left, um, he asked this man, I guess you had a hard time finding a shirt like that. And the player's response wasn't important. It was just the question that got my attention. Was he giving this very loud man with an even louder Hawaiian shirt um, an acknowledgement of, of, I'm sorry, um, 
was he just giving him comments or was he doing something else? Uh, mind you, this man was doing everything that was wrong that you could do at the table. And he said, you know, it's rare to find somebody with such a flair for a wardrobe and at the same time know so much about this game. <laughs> Steve had my full attention at this point, especially when he moved to the woman that was next to him and said, are you two married? And she said, sure are. And he said, how nice for you. Um, uh, now, I have short-term memory loss for, for many years, but I guarantee you I remember every single word that happened that night. Um, he then said to her, how big is the mobile home that you came in? Oh. <laughs> and she answered with the dimensions of something that was like a Hamptons mansion on wheels. Steve didn't miss a beat. He said, do those things have a bumpy ride that could make you hit your head and your brain turns upside down? Her response was something like, no, it's as smooth as a boat. I didn't care what she said. I had found my oasis in the desert. I couldn't contain myself. All I could do was start laughing. My table mate's too drunk to know what was going on. She, Steve gives me a glance, sort of confused, and says something to them like, I love my job, you meet the nicest people here. <laughs> now I lost it, I'm exploding with laughter, at which the first words uttered to me by Steve were, you're getting this, aren't you? <laughs> and my first, my first words to him were, every syllable. <laughs> Thank you for the entertainment, my name is Ted. Nice to meet you, Ted, I'm Steve. <clears throat> now we had a fan at the table, and all bets were off, and I don't mean the chips at the table either. In his own way, Steve was playing them like a Stradivarius. He was the consummate pro of innuendo and subliminal jabs, and he never missed. It was one line after another after another without them knowing what the hell was going on. I was a wet mess, and while hanging on each and every word from this humor god, it was time for him to move to another table. I would have moved, too, if there was an empty seat. He said, nice meeting you, Ted, and he, he left. It was right after that next table, his break came. There he goes, out of the pit, into the casino. I run behind him, tap him on the shoulder. Hi, it's Ted, isn't it? I said, I need to know you. I really need to know you. When is your next break? Can we meet for coffee? And he said, well, after the next break, I'm off for the night. So why don't we meet at the Riverview coffee shop? I said, great. Right on time, there he was in the loudest Hawaiian shirt you've ever seen. <laughs> we sat and talked for about two hours. At the beginning of the visit, all I could think was, wouldn't it be fabulous if he was gay too? Well, that dream was erased when he started to talk about all his crazy ex-wives and all the women he hadn't had. But it really didn't matter. I had a new friend, and so did he. The next trip to Laughlin, he gave me a copy of his book. He had me at hello, but that sealed the deal. It was a bromance in every sense of the word. And around that time, I moved to New York, but I kept my rent-controlled apartment in West Hollywood. It was a couple of years after meeting that our schedules meshed, and I was able to attend a story salon with him here. And I knew what touched him most was touching all of your hearts with his humor. It was my pleasure to see him here about three times. Uh, there were a few times that Steve would leave the story salon and spend the night in my guest room after staying up for hours and talking and laughing and me trying not to get too much of a contact high. He would call it a night. He very rarely was there in the morning because he'd have the departure coincide with the sunrise on Route 66, hence his shirt, heading back to Laughlin. A lovely young gal named Parrish, another blackjack dealer, a mutual friend, called me three weeks ago and said, Ted, there's no way to, to say this easy, but Steve's dead. We cried together for a few minutes, the conversation ended, and I was alone with my thoughts and my buddy. He was enjoying his freedom from work after deciding to retire and take those four-wheel trips whenever his budget and his car wasn't in the shop. After being suspended by the Riverside management at least four times, he saw the handwriting on the wall, and they mutually agreed it was time for him to move on from his gaming position. He basically got more and more aggressive with his remarks to the casino customers, and every once in a while they'd report him to the supervisor. <laughs> he also hated cigarette smoke being blown in his face, which is a job hazard for a dealer. And uh, he took an ashtray from, uh, in front of a man about a year ago and said, you've had enough, and he threw it in the garbage can. And that was like suspension number three. <laughs> During his new freedom, he joined me a couple of times at my new casino hangout, which is Palm Springs, where he was going to join me tonight, um, and where I'm heading after this. Before I leave, very, very short, uh, this just happened. Um, I got to know Steve's ex-wife number two, Virgie, who was here mm -hmm. last week and who's coming on the 12th. 
his favorite person in the whole world. They couldn't be married, but he absolutely loved Virgie. Um, she called me a few days after we lost him, and, and she was in his apartment going through things. I'm very familiar with this apartment. I had been there. And since both Parrish and Virgie told me he had died suddenly at his computer desk, I asked her to sit there and just tell me what was there so I could kind of feel a little connected. Um, she said that there were a couple of writings in his drawer, a half-smoked doobie, um, another loss was the income from his dealer, I guess, but um, there was a, a Bernie Sanders for President pin. There, was, there were two watches. One was Hillary in 2008, and one was Biden for President. She also said there were three music CDs that he was listening to. One was Billy Taylor's jazz album, Homage. One was The Best of Van Halen. And the third one was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Thank you for your time. Thank you.